I just uh, I discovered that uh, Sharon, we have been um, been responsible for this place, which was given to the Dalai Lama and Tibet House is his cultural center in America, mainly for the purpose of introducing uh, the Tibetan spiritual Buddhist medicine tradition in America, and. Um, but with all of its interconnectedness, it isn't really a religious thing, it's just a knowledge thing. And um, my wife Nina has been managing the place for 15 years now, since it was given to us. Lock, lock stock and barrel. My, as she always says, it's like winning the lottery with no cash. <laughs> on a big place. Just like an elephant falls on you out of the sky, and then you have to manage it. And uh, she's managed it really well for all these years, and uh, we welcome you to it. And all these 15 years, Sharon Salzberg has come here to elevate our spiritual level and to teach mindfulness and to share her glorious and kind heart. And uh, so we are so grateful for you, Sharon, and for coming here and for all that. And also you teach, of course, at Tibet House in the City that uh, she received the, those of you may not know, she received the Art of Freedom Award from Tibet House this, uh, to about a couple of weeks ago, I guess. And, um, yeah. and uh, actually, about five or six years ago, in concert with Mark Epstein, Dr. Mark Epstein, we gave her a, a Menla doctorate <laughs> of uh, mind psychology and mindfulness psychology, but we don't yet have certification, so it's, it's, on, a, it's on an astral plane. <laughs> she has a doctorate from us from up here, but that's less public. But um, we were delighted to give this Art of Freedom. You know, the Art of Freedom came from a British lord who was at the time the head of the London Times. And when the Royal Academy hosted our collection of Tibetan art that we organized for them uh, about uh, just more, like more than 20 years ago, um, there, the Chinese consul complained, you know, what is this Tibetan art doing there? What is this Tibetan thing? What's Tibet? You know, it's all China, you know, kind of that kind of letter. And he wrote this whole thing about how the art, Tibetan art, which is the Buddhist art of India, is preserved in Tibetan mountain there. You know, the, especially Mahayana Buddhism, but of all kinds, Theravada, Mahayana, Vajrayana. And uh, he said it's, it's the art of freedom is what it is. And he wrote this beautiful little essay, editorial, you know, to answer that. And he even said that some of the paintings here date from such and such a century, and the, and the amazing blues of the cobalt minerals that they use to like make the blue is still vivid and intense, such that you can see it in the exhibition. He said, and and he said, in that century here in England, the only thing we were painting blue was ourselves with woad when we went out for some kind of druidic ceremony. <laughs> it was really marvelous, a marvelous essay. And his answer to the sort of wish to pretend that Tibet didn't exist as an independent thing, you know, in its history. So anyway, we're, we're very delighted, and here we are back again. This is the 15th, therefore, time. Oh, we probably did several in a year, so it's probably more than 15, actually. Yeah. But 15 times we've, we've done this together, and sometimes yeah, you've done it on your own, sometimes you've brought Krishna Das here. So, so Sharon is one of the spiritual directors of the place, and it's really marvelous to have her back. And since uh, the topic this time is real love, and since she has just finished a book called Real Love, which we have to wait for with bated breath until June, until it's available, uh, because of the way presses time things, um, I, you, you start things off. I, I completely defer to you to begin up. Well. So we're talking about real love, and that's wow. your new book. And so wow. you're an expert on that. Whoa, thank you. <laughs> Well, I'm always happy uh, to be with Bob and Nena and to be here. Uh, I wanted Michael to tell that story because I've always felt this is just a really special place. And uh, people often ask me to describe it. And I say, you know, I mean, it's got nice bathrooms, but that's not it. You know? <laughs> There's something else going on that makes it, for me, you know, a very, very special place amongst the really wonderful places that I usually get to go to. Um, and I'm, I'm just so happy to be here. I remember uh, Michael and I last year as we were, uh, Bob wasn't feeling well on New Year's Eve, so he was in bed, but we were 
bringing in the new year. And I remember Michael and I saying, oh, so many people had such a rough 2015. Like, aren't we happy? I mean, it's, it's interesting because it's completely meaningless in a way. I mean, it's a construct, right? This is the turning of the year. Um, mm -hmm. And being a Buddhist and a Jew, I get three a year. <laughs> I, know, I have the American New Year, I have the Jewish New Year, and I have the, the Buddhist New Year, the Tibetan New Year, you know, so. Uh, but it's, it's a, you know, the Tibetan New Year probably is the most reflection of something else, which would be some astronomical configuration, you know, but uh, I don't know what December 31st, you know means nonetheless it feels like it means something and it, it feels like it's a transition and it's it's a time of letting go uh hopefully letting go of burdens we feel we've been carrying and it's a time of moving forward into the unknown but sometimes with great resolve or uh, hope or um determination for greater balance or greater wisdom something like that and so we stood there on the eve of, of December 31st and said, okay, let's make it a really good year. And somewhere recently I was like, uh, I said, what did that astrologer say? I don't exactly remember. How long does it last? So I'm really happy he's coming back. Um, so I can press him. Um, and, and, you know, coming here in this particular time, it's also, it's very informal. I feel like we're all here just as friends and uh, for those of you, how many of you are here for the first time in this place? Wow. You know, it, like all places that are new, it can be confusing and don't hesitate if you have to go up to the desk. I was thinking this because I never know where I am. <laughs> My friends all tease me that that's why I like New York City so much because the streets are numbered, <laughs> you know, and it's like, where are we doing yoga? And, What's that seven-sided building? Like, just ask, you know, feel free always to kind of check it out and figure out where you're meant to be and where you're going. And, uh, and we'll just have a really wonderful time together. Um, I see Menla's got new chairs, that's fun. Are you all um, together? Is that a, yeah. So I have a Krishnadas story. Krishnadas is an old friend who uh, I met actually at my first retreat. I went to India to learn how to meditate uh, in 1970, and I began meditation in the context of this intensive 10-day retreat in January of 1971. And Krishnadas was at that retreat as a participant, and uh, Ramdas and friends like Joseph Goldstein and all kinds of people were there. So. Uh, and then in more recent years, Krishnadas and I have gotten into the habit of often going, trying to go to Dalai Lama teachings together. And so um, we were in Toronto in uh, some teaching many years ago in this exhibition hall, and they had these rows of chairs all locked together, extremely uncomfortable. <laughs> Not like these, you know, very narrow. It was the kind of scene where the person on one side of you like tilted, you had a tilt too, you know, and so everyone was like really uncomfortable. And Krishnas was sitting on the aisle, and then there was me, and then this whole row of people, and uh, one day Krishnas tapped me on the shoulder, and I looked at him, and he was like much further into the aisle, and he said to me, unhook your chair. And I thought, unhook my chair, I never thought of that. I just thought I had to stay here being unhappy. <laughs> so that was my symbolic um, teaching for the entire event. <laughs> so I don't know that you need to unhook these chairs, but because they look very comfortable, and they are very comfortable, and they're singular. Uh, they're unhookable. They're unhookable. <laughs> Things can be done, which is always good to keep in mind. Um, and I had something else come into my mind when... Uh, our wonderful yoga teachers are speaking. And I think that is, it's really like the spirit of coming together and learning, which means you can't really learn if you feel like there's nothing to learn or you have to be perfect at something, right? So that, that's a pretty forlorn attitude to have, that 
you know, to be embarrassed or to feel like, oh, it's not really, I'm not good enough at this. And nobody's good enough at anything. Um, so, uh, but when you were speaking, it reminded me of uh, many years ago, I have a, a retreat center I co-founded in Massachusetts, the <clears throat> Insight Meditation Society. In 1984, we brought a Burmese meditation teacher uh, named Sayada Upandita to come teach there never having met him before, but having heard he was a very great teacher. So I and many of my friends sat with him for this three-month retreat. And he uh, was meeting us each individually uh, once a day, six days a week, just to very briefly to where we would have a chance to describe our practice and he would give us some feedback and we know we would go on. and. Um, he got in, he had a habit also of sort of getting into these routines where he would tend to say the same thing over and over and over and over and over again until something switched inside of you and then he would, he would switch as well. So when he came, I had been practicing for almost 14 years and I co-founded the center and it was like a teaching and, and uh, we just got into this routine where for a long time I'd go in to see him in the morning and I would describe what was going on in my meditation and he would look at me and he would say, well, in the beginning it can be like that. And I think, I'm not a beginner. <laughs> but that was his feedback. So that was all he said. So I'd leave. And the next day maybe I'd come in and I'd describe something completely different. And he would look at me and he would say, well, in the beginning it could be like that. And I was fuming. I thought, I'm not a beginner. But I didn't say anything. And I laughed and like day after day after day after day. Whatever I said, whatever I described, he would respond with, well, in the beginning it could be like that. At one point I felt like I had a giant neon 14 in my brain and I was like flashing him. I'm not a beginner. I've been practicing for 14 years. And then one day, it's like I got it. And I remembered, oh, it's not insulting, right? Remember the whole thing about beginner's mind and you want that kind of openness and interest and you don't wanna feel jaded and you know what's coming next and you're only half-hearted and you want that complete presence and, and wholeness of, of being a beginner. I thought, that's a good thing to be. So of course the day I got it was the day he stopped saying it. <laughs> and he went on to something else, so. Uh, I think there are many things, you know, in uh, whatever we are practicing, whatever we're exploring, whatever risks we're taking with our awareness, with our more uh, accustomed ways of being. Uh, it's great, you know, and you don't always hit that mark of like, wow, I'm great. Uh, in fact, my first instruction, which would be fun to sit a little bit tonight, even just for a few minutes, um, when I went to that, my first retreat in India, the first instruction I ever received was sit down and feel your breath. And as many of you have heard me say in talks or whatever, I felt very contemptuous of that. I thought, feel my breath. You know, where's the magical, esoteric, fantastic technique that's going to wipe out all my suffering? I came all the way to India. I feel my breath. That's <laughs> Anybody can do that. And I thought, eh, how hard can this be? And then it was like, whoa, <laughs> this is not so easy. Unlike my thought, like, oh, what will it be like 800 breaths or 900 breaths before my mind wanders? It was like one breath or two breaths and I'd be gone and I'd be way gone. And I kept hearing that there was something very important, really crucial actually, in the moment after we've been distracted where we need to let go gently and start over again without being disheartened, right? Or without judging ourselves or blaming ourselves. We let go and we begin again. And I heard that over and over again. I just did not believe it. But uh, I just read something last week, which was basically, if the training, it's almost like the muscle training is in the letting go and starting over, that's not gonna happen if you don't get distracted. So being distracted, being lost, getting sleepy, feeling overwhelmed, that's not a problem actually, that's the training ground, we need that in order to actually 
do what we're, we're here to do. So we can have fun together, you know, um, each of us within our own experience and, and with one another, and hopefully really challenge some of those old paradigms of, of perfectionism or needing to have a certain kind of experience. And it is, it's, I know the social pressure. Everybody, we're here for a long time. It's a big investment being here, you know. We'd like to leave here and run into a friend and be able to say, well, you know, the first night was a little rough, but then, I don't know, I started practicing and it was just like this peace, this tremendous peace. It was almost like this, this indescribable, unfathomable peace. And then the peace sort of started shimmering on the edges. <coughs> it turned into bliss and it was like, <laughs> it was amazing, blissful peace. And, we don't really want to say, you know, my back hurt, and I was sleepy, and I was worried, and, you know. But there's a certain way in which, um, as we talk about meditation at any rate, the whole point is not what we're experiencing, it's how we are with what we're experiencing. So how much presence, how much balance, how much love are we bringing to whatever is coming up? And while it's more satisfying socially to be able to say what's coming up is all these glorious things, it actually doesn't matter. Because maybe our back hurts and our knee hurts and our head hurts and we're sleeping, we're anxious. But we are so different with those things than we have been before. That's considered really, really good. Meditation. So part of the challenge in being here is stepping out of our ordinary lanes of judgment, you know, it's not the same criteria that we usually hold ourselves to. Something very, very different. And that's fantastic and also challenging. So here we are. It, it's New Year's. And I love the um, Medicine Buddha, which I'm also going to ask Bob to describe as well as, I asked him to describe the Tibetan New Year because it's the one that has some, some meaning. But uh, I just bought a new car. Uh, and I have a car in Massachusetts. I spend a lot of time in New York City where I don't have a car. Uh, but I have a car in Massachusetts and the car was just like really falling apart, poor car. I was very attached to it. Uh, so I had to buy a new car and the car I bought, um, they asked me for my first choice of color, which was mulberry, which is like burgundy. Uh, but they couldn't get me a mulberry car. They got me a blue car, a dark blue car. I was sort of morose for a moment. But then I thought, that's the color of the medicine Buddha. <laughs> I have a medicine Buddha car, you know? Yeah, and I was yeah. extremely happy. So I keep looking at it, oh, that's the color of my car. <laughs> so can you tell us about the medicine Buddha? Oh, sure. The, med the Buddha, there's a... Um... Um, I mean, there's very way, various ways of telling it. There were sutras about the medicine Buddha. And um, there were seven brothers who, in another universe, like many, many aeons ago, who became medicine Buddhas. Which means that um, in addition to teaching the Four Noble Truths, as all Buddhas do, which how many of you know the Four Noble Truths, by the way? How many people here know the Four Noble Truths? I don't know, many, okay. How many have never heard really of the Four Noble Truths or brand new to the Four Noble Truths? Yeah, and then there's some that's sort of really in between. Have two or three? <laughs> well, Four Noble Truths is like a medical diagnosis, which the Buddha made his primary teaching. And actually, all of his later, most complicated teachings all fit into that. And basically, they are the that the unenlightened life is suffering which will never be satisfactory. The cause of that is, uh, is fundamentally craving, anger, and ignorance. Especially ignorance is the root cause. And ignorance is defined not as just not knowing something, it's knowing something that is not the case. That, you know, knowing something wrongly and being stuck in that mistaken knowledge. But his that's the diagnosis of the cause. Then the prognosis is, however, one can free oneself from that with wisdom, meaning knowing the reality of oneself and the world. And then the therapy is called the Eightfold Path, which is like a whole set of educations, ethical education, 
mental education and intellectual education, science, like scientific, and nat about the nature of reality. And um, so all Buddhas teach that. So in a way, all Buddhas really are therapists rather than prophets, you know, because they, they contradict, uh, Buddha contradicted the religious teachings of his time, that, and uh, Buddhists would contradict other religious teachings in the sense that there is somebody outside, a god, or several gods, or a goddess, who's going to save you. And um, the Buddha said that actually, if the gods had the power to save us all, we'd all be saved already. <laughs> and we're not, we're suffering. So the reason is not that the gods are bad, they would like us to be saved, because the Buddha didn't disbelieve the existence of gods. He talked to them, actually, at least in the sutras they say he did, and they talked to him. But um, they just were not omnipotent and they were not omniscient. They were very knowledgeable and very powerful, but not omnipotent. So they just didn't have the power to save another person from suffering. So, or even themselves, some of them. Because they take, the problem with gods is they tend to become a little bit egotistical. Because they think, hey, I'm God, wow. <laughs> they get really excited about it. And, uh, Whereas Buddha is not, and uh, what a Buddha is, is a person who becomes completely aware of the nature of the reality, and by that complete awareness uh, becomes uh, free of suffering. So then has, is stuck in the very awkward situation of not being able to help others become free of suffering that way, just like a teacher cannot cause this, force the student or cause the student to understand. They can only provide methods whereby the student can themselves come to understand, right? You can't, many of you might be teachers, actually, of one kind or another. Every mother is a teacher, for sure, and I see there are many here who must be mothers, fathers. And you can't make that kid understand. You can give lots of clues and hints and, and um, reasons and so on, and then they will eventually understand, hopefully. And... Uh, so that's sort of what, that's a very tiny nutshell about Buddha. Then, apparently one time during his teaching career, 45 years long, that the Buddha had, he was in a medical mood, more physical medical mood, as well as mental and spiritual. And um, he looked at the world and saw beings suffering in the world, which he was not. He, when you understand this, you are free of the suffering, which is a surprise. And... Um, he was surprised himself. He said when it happened, he was rather happy. <laughs> Delighted about it. And then he felt, he saw when he, when he became free of that suffering by understanding the reality, when he looked at other beings, this is the funny one, when he looked at them, he saw that basically they were kind of made of that freedom themselves. In other words, they were, they were kind of made of energy in a certain way that if it was flowing, they would be, they should be happy if they knew their own true nature. But because they don't, they are feeling very dissatisfied and fundamentally they feel like alienated from the rest of the universe, you know, self versus everything else. And once you feel that, then it's a struggle to, to where, where, how is, what's my share here? What's my state here? Is the world doing what I need? Am I getting what I need from it? Uh, is it not bothering me in some way, consuming me in some way? And once you do that, then basically, it, 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 when stress is there, it's you versus the, every, everything in the universe, and you lose, of course. It's not even, it's not really a genius idea. It's very obvious. But whereas if you understand your relationship to the universe, and you realize that, in a way, it and you are totally interwoven, then apparently you, you don't feel alienated in that way and you're able to feel happy rather than suffer. So, but then he saw that a lot of the people he was able to therefore help in his lifetime who to teach uh, were not able to study what he was teaching because they were too sick. So that's when he got into a medical mood. Okay, I'm, I it was circled around to explain that. And the minute he did, he turned blue. <laughs> he turned dark blue. And there's a symbolic reason for that. The medicine Buddha is, uh, has this blue color. And uh, of course there's a legend where these seven brothers came from this other universe to help him out with the medicine teaching. So the, the seven are up above, if you in this painting, for example, they are the seven. And, um, and sort of let him be a medicine Buddha. 
And then he created a vision around himself, which is what this place is dedicated to, where temporarily in his field, everyone also felt somehow less alienated. And they felt, you know, normally we're worried about germs, we're worried in the woods out here, we're worried about ticks in the warmer weather, you know, we're worried about bugs, we're worried about the food, maybe something wrong with it, you know, pollution of different kinds. Right? We're worried about what might come at us from the outside in regard. Someone coughs, you know, we're worried we're going to catch a cold. Whereas the medicine Buddha vision is everything is medicine. The whole, all plants, especially the plant world is really. The medicine Buddha holds a plant in this hand, which is something called the Myrobalan plant. The, ter the Latin word is Terminalia chibulia, which are the, in Sanskrit they call the Arura plant, Arud. And there are varieties of it, and it's a kind of panacea medicine. It grows in India in trees, small trees. And he's holding a branch of that with several aru, the kind of nuts, I think, there, which they grind into powder when they make medicine. So he holds that plant. And he sort of, therefore, reminds us of our interconnection with the plant world. And, um, and so in his field, everyone suddenly felt connected to things, and that they saw the positivity of everything. And in his vision, even a poison in a certain amount, mixed with knowledge, can be a medicine, right? And then uh, even, even things that are normally healthy, if done in excess or in the wrong combinations, can be poison. So he had a vision like that, and then in that vision he taught a medicine teaching, uh, which is recorded in various forms, and uh, according to the Buddhists, it has influenced what's known as the Ayurvedic tradition in India, and eventually it becomes very interconnected in China and Korea and Japan with their medical traditions. One of the reasons that Buddhism spread from India everywhere was they never had any crusade or anything like that. And the reason it spread is that the Buddhist monks and nuns seemed to know more about healing people than the local physicians. And usually they healed an empress or a grandmother, or, you know, emperor, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, Queen Mother or something in China or Korea or some one of the sub kingdoms of China, and then they would take an interest, and then they would take an interest in the spiritual teaching. Usually, when they learned about the medicine, when the medicine benefited them, and uh, so that's the medicine Buddha. And we have a meditation here. Maybe should we introduce that meditation? Sure. We have a meditation that is kind of the signature meditation of of uh, Menla, and we might do that together. You want to do that? You want to do a little meditation? So sit in, sit, sit, take, you know, sit up in a meditation posture, and uh, you can stay in the chair, but cross the ankles if you're in the chair. Try to keep your back a little straight, tuck your chin, and make your eyes half closed, mostly closed. Uh, better a little open if you can, but and looking like at your tip of your nose, something really boring visual field, and um, hands, uh, palms flat on one another in, in the lap. And or sometimes I actually like to clasp the fingers like that. I don't know why, but I know that's not that's not really kosher. But I like to, I like them with the th thumb tips touching, whichever way you do it. And um, then draw a few breaths to calm down. Meaning, just you be with your breath. And you know, it's very interesting, you know, the most beginning thing of being with your breath that Sharon talked about in the highest, most esoteric Buddhist Tantra, when you do it combined with a certain sort of insight, it's like the supreme thing. <laughs> it's the highest possible thing. Most advanced, you dissolve into your own central channel, and your chakra is open, and you know, there's ways of describing it. But uh, it's where you go, you, you conquer death, actually. You realize the true nature of reality and go beyond, you know, you become conscious from your soul level or something like that. You can put it all those kinds of ways. Anyway, you just calm down and, and breathe. And when you pay attention to your breath, it's very hard not to alter it. You know, then you sort of want to take an extra deep breath or breathe quickly. And then you can a little bit modify to try to breathe sort of slowly. And um, unless your nose is congested, it's good to breathe it through the nostrils, mostly. And then, the signature of Menla thing is the following. 
you turn your attention back toward yourself, back into yourself, as if you were outside of yourself a little bit looking into you, looking into your own face, into your own brain, into your own physical body, and looking for your real essence or your real identity or what's really you within yourself. And when you do that, just quickly, don't, don't make a big strain out of it, you get, you should feel slightly puzzled and maybe a tiny bit disoriented since you don't really find any place immediately to land upon. Your chest rises and falls, you know, the air goes in and out of your nostrils into your lungs, and your, the diaphragm goes up and down, and your, your ribs expand, your chest, and the brain is like a bunch of, you have a model of it in your mind from all the neuroscience lectures you attended, and it's like a, a labyrinth, the, you, you don't really find yourself in it. And um, although someone may pres presume there's a particular neuron that's you, but you don't find it. When you look in its quick way, you don't find it at the heart, you don't find it in the nose, you don't find it, you don't know what, you, so you sort of don't know what to find that's the real you. And then, but in this case, don't be worried about feeling a little disoriented, just let go of your sense of identity, meaning same essential sameness, and along with that, let go of your world description, the atlas world that you hold around you, like where you are and what it is and what's up, up and down and in and out and all of this, and sort of let yourself melt away, kind of. kind of go down to where your subatomic particles dissolve into light. You could pure light, you could say. Just casually, you know, no big thing. After all, the scientists tell us we are made of atoms. Really, you know, like what we think of as solid skin is really a bunch of atoms and molecules. And then the quantum people tell us the atoms Nobody has quite found the ultimate solid component in an atom, or even in subatomic particles. And then there's a place where the particles kind of escape into light, where they sort of they become every, go everywhere and disappear. So you just we're just mimicking that in a, just a, like a slight fantasy. And then realize that that since. We can't really put our finger on the solidity of the self, at least not quickly. We rise up, imagine that you rise up in a kind of ideal body, energy body. That's your ideal meditative self. And then you look up with your sort of mind's eye, the third eye in your forehead or something. You look up through the skull, through the roof, through the time of day, into the sky. And then in the sky you see the medicine Buddha. You see this blue, deep blue being in a shining, sort of sunny, moonlit, sunny, sunlit sky with fluffy clouds. And around him all other kinds of healing beings, doctors, ancient time even, like, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi, how he appears in Star Wars after he, is, he, he died in a sort of luminous, transparent, or semi-transparent body. And then you can add to the host that you see around the Medicine Buddha, whoever has been a healing influence in your life, and, um, or in your mind could be historical figures, could be spiritual teachers from any religious traditions, angels, whatever, whatever. There's like a whole heavenly host up there in this meditative space, like you're in a shrine world, 
with all kinds of healing beings. And then they're smiling down at you because they're surprised that your imagination has discovered their presence. But actually they are, they are there looking after living beings, human beings and other living beings, all the time anyway, in some sort of subtle light body form. And when you imagine them, you're actually contacting their real presence. Even though you can't necessarily, unless you're highly trained, you can't hold the inner vision in a stable way. Just like you could think of the Washington Monument or something for a moment in your mind's eye, if you've ever seen it. But then you would, it would be hard to hold on to it, to have it steadily appear there in your mind's sky, let's call it. But you sort of, once you encounter it, you have a sense that it's there, that medicine Buddha is there, that all these healing beings are there. And then you imagine that rays of blessing, of like rainbow rays, flow down from that medicine Buddha. And they flow down in a gentle, like a rainbow, shimmering, and they come into you and penetrate your crown and flow into your body and energize you and the different colored energy rays stimulate your molecules and cells and make you feel clear and calm and healed and your sort of kinks in your sense of being <coughs> are kind of washed away little shadows in your thoughts and then notice around you, in your meditative space, are all kinds of other beings, actually huge hosts of them. And in the front rows are ones you recognize. Sort of in the front rows on the left side are your loved ones, either who may be here nearby you now, or who may be back home, or maybe in history, if they've passed, or maybe in other countries. And then in front in the rows, row, directly ahead, are acquaintances who you know about, but you don't have strong feelings about, you sort of don't really know them, but you're a little familiar with them. And then in the front rows on the right side are beings you've had trouble with, you might be afraid of, even enemies. You may not have physically met them, or they may not have yet hurt you, but when you think of them, you feel uncomfortable, because they're like enemies. They could be enemies afraid of them, they have hurt you in the past, or you feel they might hurt you in the future. But then the, the energies, the rainbow rays that you're filling up with, and are soothing you and healing you and making you feel okay where you are and, and when you are, kind of it overflows from you naturally, which, which it is when you feel really well when you look at another, you look upon them benevolently, kind of, you feel like you feel well, why don't they feel well, or you wish they did feel well, or maybe you notice they feel well. And so you radiate out to them that positive feeling. It just automatically flows to you from Medicine Buddha and all the gods and angels and heavenly hosts and human healers and whoever it is that has ever been benevolent and beneficial to you. And then this all flows through you toward all the beings around you, but also enemies and acquaintances as well as loved ones. So it's hard to not favor the loved ones, but the idea is it just reflects from you in all directions. And in Tibetan tradition and Indian Mahayana tradition, they have, a, they have the idea that when you do a session of meditation, even if you're mainly going to focus on your breath, that it's a good idea to create a, an imaginary setting like this. And in a way, that's what you do when you go to a meditation hall, with maybe a Buddha image in the front of it. In some traditions, in a Zen tradition, you have bodhisattvas behind you, and you just have a wall in front of you, not a Buddha image. But there's, but most traditions you have a Buddha image of some kind, maybe sometimes some 
ancient patriarchs and monks and things, famous monks. And so that's creating a setting where you feel you're in a field of your own potential. You're not just worshipping like some other being because again, Buddha said he could not save you. But you were inspired by being in the field of someone who felt saved, delivered from suffering themselves by some, through some understanding and experience. <coughs> and they saw other beings as capable of the same freedom that they had achieved. So then you feel in the field of that. That's, that's what's an inspiring thing. Before you focus on whatever your meditation theme is, you create a set in a setting like that, so that you kind of feel kind of perked up on your best focus, even if it's still quite distracted, but still you sort of set yourself in a certain positive setting with a feeling of positive support in your environment, like a shrine that inspires you. And wise beings and loving beings that bless you. And so you then forget about that and do what you're doing. But that puts you in a state of receptivity to what insights you might have yourself inside. So this is the wisdom of the, that tradition. Don't worry if you can't keep track of whatever you envisioned. Once you just have a flashing vision of it, just feel that it's there. And it's this, I say this is a signature Menla thing because while you're here on a retreat, the idea is to have a sense of the presence of the field of the Medicine Buddha within you and around you and in the nature here and the deer that run around. And luckily, I think the ticks are frozen or sleeping. <laughs> so don't worry about them. We will worry again in the spring about them. Take precautions. And the other human beings around. Eddie's. <laughs> so back to you. Was that, was that helpful? Yeah, it was very helpful. <coughs> what, let's see, what time is it? Oh, it's Yeah, fine. we should probably. Yeah. Soon, soon we will. So any questions? Anybody have any questions? Things you'd particularly like to see addressed by either of us? Uh, we'll have many sessions together to, to have things like that, but is there anything right away or something like kind of the thing you really want to focus on or learn or understand in this whole retreat? Do you, do you want to bring up some things yeah. like that to us just in this last, last short time we have before we take a break? And we do Tibet, <laughs> we do Menla sleep yoga. We have a sleep yoga too. <laughs> we do, which we'll explain at the very end. But in the meantime, there must be some things you, I'm going to go up there and what's going to happen? So and, did someone have something? And uh, we will, a, we will a have a microphone. Device. Yeah. Where's the mic? Which would really help a lot. And I will, by the way, talk about real love tomorrow. So. Yeah. Anybody? Come when there's now. more time. <laughs> something? Da -da, da -da -da. Who's going to be the first? Oh, okay. There she is. Okay, she's going to bring a mic? the microphone. Oh. Bring your mic. <laughs> Say your name first. Is it working? Justin, Justin the mics, the mics, the the mics.
No, they're all dead? Well, just speak. We'll, we'll get it. Oh, no, there is. Oh, something came alive. Hi. Hi. Um, What's your name? My name's Nicole. Nicole? Yes. Okay. And, um, Could you hold it a little bit closer? I started reading the Tibetan Book of the Dead, your translation. Oh. Um, and it's heavy. And um, I was wondering if you could, I know it's, it's a lot, but I'd like to understand it. Mm -hmm. You'd like to understand the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Okay, well, I'm not, <laughs> I want to explain that in a second, but when you stop, I, when I talk about the sleep yoga, I'll go, I will mention something about that, and I will remember to come back around that. But it's a very wonderful thing that it's, it's kind of science. You know, I always say Buddhism is science-based. The meditation teachings, even the thing about just your breath and mindfulness, which is the seventh branch of the Eightfold Path that I mentioned in the Four, four Noble Truths, you know, the Fourth Noble Truth, and uh, uh, that's based on, and the yogas actually, that are all used there, which Buddhism also shares with Hinduism, they're based on the kind of science of the way the mind and energies and the nervous system work. It isn't just some sort of like, you know, blind faith thing. It's a, it's a science of how you gain, how you can gain control over your mind. You know, it's really, India is so great how it developed that ancient time. A little bit ahead of Greece at the time where our tradition kind of came from. And, um, and so even there's a science, according to their claims, which naturally we have to investigate, they want us to investigate, that you can, you know, consciously understand the dying and the death and the after-death process. And that there is an after-death process, for example, it's a scientific claim with evidence that we can, we can evaluate, that we can either agree with or not agree with when we evaluate. It isn't just a faith claim, it's a scientific-based claim, based on people's personal experience. And uh, so, uh, so the Book of the Dead, it's really not called the Book of the Dead, actually. One of the scientific insights is there are no dead people. <laughs> but what happens is your consciousness leaves a particular uh, gross body or, you know, flesh and blood embodiment, meat space body, as the computer people say. It leaves such a body and it goes in a subtle body, like in a dream, like when you sleep, your meat space body is the sleep, and then you have a dream, and you're in a, some kind of body of the dream, because you see and hear things, things happen to you, you know, you run after something, or run away from something, you enjoy something, or you fear something, you know, you have dream experience, and then you have some kind of body in the dream, like a reconstituted energy body, sort of. And, um, you know, like you have an eye that sees whatever you see in the dream, you know, you have a dream eye, you know. And, uh, uh, and just as you can learn to lucidly dream, you know, which people now have experimentally shown in the, in the West that there is such a thing as lucid dreaming. More about that? Just as you can learn to do that, the, the Buddhists in India, not just Tibet, in India, they, they, they claim to have experienced lucid dying and lucid after death, what they call the between state, and um, how to be reborn in a good neighborhood <laughs> and in a good life form not in a negative one, and, or rather how not to be reborn, driven by base instincts, you know, like uh, helplessly driven by instinctual patterns and so on. So that's a long conversation, and I don't, it's not the time to go into it, but, but uh, we will address that. It's, the real name of the book is the Tibetan book of natural liberation by learning in the subtle between state, is what it's actually called, not the Book of the Dead. And when I worked on translating it, I, that was a big eureka for me. Nobody stays dead. <laughs> they immediately on to the next thing, pretty much. They can rest for a little, but they really on to the next thing. Now there was another hand almost going up over here. Yes. So sort of brief initial opening questions and brief answers. So um, this is a very simple, simple question. You had in the meditation. Can hold the mic real close. You had the meditation with I our think eyes. It didn't go on. To, uh, the, the, on, with the eyes oh, there you go. closed. <laughs> um, so why do it? Why do it with the eyes closed versus having your eyes half open in the meditation that we just did? It's a very simple did you question. did you suggest having eyes closed in the meditation? No. no. Well, open. you can. Uh, Sharon gives you permission. She's nicer than me. <laughs> but in the tradition, technically, 
the ideal is to have them lidded, sort of half closed, and then focused uh, toward, the, like near the tip of your nose, the two eyes. I only have one, so not a problem for me. But if you have two, focus near the tip of the nose, uh, without making a strong cross eye pressure. If you have a tiny little nose, if you have a nice long nose, then it's no sweat. <laughs> and and the reason for that, and if possible, keep like that. And the reason for that is to create a boring visual field where you're not in danger of falling asleep, which you might if you close. And if they're wide open, you're going to be stuck in your visual stimuli because we're very, very much used to always being, you know, noticing things visually when our eyes are open. So, sort of the half open is said to be like the ideal meditative, long term meditative posture. But for, for beginners, since everything is okay for beginners, <laughs> Closed is sometimes easier for a busy, you know, thing. So that's so Sharon does give people that permission, and uh, and I, I appreciate that. And she gives me that permission, and I do appreciate that. And we're all beginners, and also, uh, you know, m most certainly all of my original practice was uh, not in the Tibetan tradition. It was with Burmese teachers or people who had studied uh, in Burma, and so what I. Um, present is more often in accordance with those earliest influences I had. Um, and so that's kind of part of the variety of what um, happens here. You know, is that we're coming from, from different, slightly different angles, with the core being the Four Noble Truths, which is the, which is the same. Okay, yes, in the back. Question. Yeah, I'd like to ask a question. Are you a Buddhist monk? Um, not yet. Not yet. You have a maroon thing and you have the Buddhist head I've got the hairstyle. <laughs> certain My attributes hair uh, down Okay, obviously. what's your name? Uh, Warren. Warren? We, we met, if you recall, during Jason's wow. wedding. Oh, okay, great. Yeah. In front of Jason Dunbar. And, um, but my question concerns equanimity in the, in the sense of the 51 secondary mental factors. And um, since we're doing a retreat that involves both yoga, uh, asana practice, and uh, meditation practice, um, what I, my question is, there are certain practices you do during the meditation session, and then you arise from the session, and then you're doing yoga. So you're then going into the yoga session, and then you're arising from that, going back to meditation. And the, the meaning of equanimity, as I understand it, is that you're able to take the practice from the cushion when you arise from the cushion and maintain kind of mindfulness, right, between sessions. So there's a kind of cross-pollination between meditation session and yoga session. How do you recommend maintaining that equanimity in that, in that sense of the word? Yeah. Or do you recommend? Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, I, uh, don't tend to define equanimity in that way, so that was interesting. Um, uh, more when I use the word equanimity, it, it is balance. And in the context of mindfulness practice, it's the balance that leads to wisdom in the context of, say, loving kindness or compassion practice. It's the balance that comes from wisdom. Uh, but what you're talking about is very important, you know, whether you call it equanimity or not, um, which is to have some sense of continuity through the basic principles of one's practice. And I think that uh, part of what happens here, because we've been together for so many years, is an emphasis on, um, you know, if the uh, morning meditation was a lot about compassion, you know, would be the... You know, where do you see compassion in your yoga practice? And where do you see it missing? And I just want to say also, just speaking of words, um, even though I use language exactly the way you use language, you know, and I would ask that kind of question myself, when I am asked that question, uh, you know, how am I going to maintain equanimity? Or at the end of a retreat, people usually say, how can I keep this level of concentration? Or how can I stay mindful all day long at work? And my very frank answer is you won't. You know, it's not gonna happen. And so that's why I think one of the most enduring and critical learnings is about beginning again. You know, it's because you're in some space and you feel 
incredibly balanced and wonderful and your heart is overflowing with love for everybody and then you're really annoyed and, you know, for whatever reason, you know, and uh, we learn to recognize that sooner and sooner. We learn to let go more and more gracefully. Uh, and we learn to begin again. It's like, oh right, you know, I don't actually want to act from that place of annoyance. I don't want to shove them aside. I don't want to yell at them. You know, like, you realize it came up, you let it go and you come back. So that's one of the reasons that I tend to, probably ad nauseum, emphasize that, that particular part of the practice, because I think that's real. And my, one of my favorite Bob Thurman translations is the <laughs> word realistic. You know, which is another word, like equanimity, which we certainly could talk about, is not very glamorous, it's not very alluring. Like, my first meditation teacher was S.N. Goenka uh, in India, and he used to go around all the time saying, be equanimous, be equanimous, be equanimous. And we used to whisper to one another, is that a word? What does that mean, you know? Like, I never heard that word. And even in the form of equanimity, it's weird. And and not maybe that enticing, like... We used to make a joke, it's a bird, it's a plane. No, it's a quantum mouse. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard that one before. <laughs> right. You know, so realistic, it's like, if somebody said, you know, the sum total of your spiritual effort will be that you get more realistic, you think, really? It's a little grim and boring, but you think about it, you know, and it's, it's like the opposite of the proverbial banging our head against the wall. When we're as unrealistic as we get, yeah. like I am gonna be able to hold on successfully, finally. I'm gonna be able to stop change from happening at last. <laughs> I'm gonna be completely independent and disconnected in a way that doesn't make me unhappy. You know, all the ways that we are so unrealistic, that's where the suffering comes from. And the more, in alignment we get with the truth of things, then we're happier and happier, you know, so. I think you That's actually good. get the, the, the key insight that I get from you, there you yeah. is that, yes, you're coming out, you come out of meditation. Can you hold it? Because he's not going to hear you at all. Oh, you come out of, <laughs> it's not working anymore. I'll just talk loud. You're coming out of meditation and you get annoyed. And yeah. And one of the things you can take with you is that you, the awareness that you're getting annoyed that's right. a little sooner. That's right. I think that's what I was kind of yeah, yeah. to being yeah, sensitive yeah. to the stream of your own mind and, yeah. and being a little more tuned to it. Yeah, and I think it's it's a combination of that, absolutely, yeah. and the actual ability to let go. Yeah. Uh, because it's not like disliking what you're feeling or condemning yourself or saying I'm a rotten meditator. I've been here for three days, or I'm you know, been meditating for 30 years or whatever, and I'm still, you know, annoyed. It, it's a much, uh, it's very different than that, you know, this process of letting go without judgment and the ability to, to kind of regroup, mm -hmm. uh, which is really a kind of resilience training. So it's like those three things, you know, are skills that we're, we're definitely training. Thank you so much. Uh -huh. Okay. Yes, I think, okay, wait, well, last question, maybe. Yes. Two questions, last two questions. Yeah, you got the microphone, first. Yeah. yeah? Oh, yeah. Oh, good. Thank you. Which, which is the best beginner's guide to Tibetan Buddhism? What, what? What's the best beginner's guide to Tibetan Buddhism? Oh, best beginner's guide to Tibetan Buddhism? Uh, well, it's terrible to say, but... I like my book in a revolution. <laughs> I feel bad saying that since it is only Dalai Lama is my teacher. But uh, you know the Tibetans themselves, they're sort of used to they sort of recite okay four noble truths. You know they have these categories that they recite, and the Dalai Lama explains them and deals with them in questions. But in a way, I think to sort of make connected to an American's quest for. And, and sort of encounter that the Inner Revolution book, I think, is, is realistic. <laughs> it's very realistic. Although I have to give Alan Wallace credit for that. Do you? Yes, yeah, I do. He, I first read it in one book he used, and instead of, which he said about realistic, you know, usually in the Eightfold Path, people say right view, right motivation, right action, right 
speech, right, 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 right and wrong, you know. But because they're thinking, they're trying to make it into a religion from the time they met Buddhism. And then they, want, they feel that religions are supposed to come from an authority and then give you a rule and then you're either right or wrong. Whereas in Buddha's case, he really wasn't a prophet, and basically he's telling people, God can't help you. I mean, he, actually, God can help you or harm you. I mean, different gods can, and there's one more powerful one, can help or harm, but can't save you completely from suffering. You have to do that yourself. And that was his main thing. And the way you do that is not by believing something, it's by experiencing something through, through you know, cultivating... Uh, insight, mindfulness and insight, and, um, and concentrate, developing a higher ability to concentrate your mind, and learning. You know? And so, um, uh, so therefore, the positive is realistic, and the distorting and the unpositive is unrealistic. And we suffer because we're unrealistic, you know, we think we're the center of the universe, and the universe doesn't agree <laughs> in the most annoying manner. And, then, and not only that, the other beings in the universe think they're the center, and then they annoy with us because we don't agree that they are, and so on. So, so real, the great thing about using realistic is, it, 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 it celebrates the Buddha's claim that he discovered what reality is, and experienced it fully, and couldn't make you do so, but that you also could be capable of that. And that's the way you'll be happy, because luckily, reality is happiness. We know just, to, just to get real love, since that's the title of the seminar in there, reality is love, actually, the Buddhist Buddha said. The third noble truth is his description of reality, which is nirvana. And nirvana means being blown away. And then it can be misinterpreted as meaning it means it simply not exist, you know, being blown out of existence. But like, you know, like a gangster would say, I took out my gun and I blew him away. <laughs> That's not that kind of blown away. It's the person who went to the, either the rock concert or the Beethoven concert and said, how was it? And he says, I was blown away. It was so beautiful. And what do they mean by that? They mean that their normal feeling of kind of dissatisfaction and angst and like, what am I doing here? What's going on? Was temporarily suspended by the beauty of that particular reality of that art form, you know? So Buddha's discovery is that the world is actually such an art form, not by somebody, just not, that's its nature. And, uh, and the way we can discover that ourselves, and, and therefore there's, and all he can do is help teach us methods of how to become more realistic. You know, we have a saying in the West, ignorance is bliss, which implies that reality, if you know too much of it, will make you unhappy. Whereas in the Buddhist thing, ignorance is suffering. And wisdom, knowledge of reality, is bliss, you know, brings bliss. So, so anyway, I don't want to go at length too much except to encourage you that, that uh, reality is love. That's what it is. Real love means reality. Nirvana. And uh, when you attain nirvana, you can't help yourself but loving every being because you real, reality flows through you as love for every being. You can't help it. You just feel so good. It's like when you feel really good. You're kind of benevolent even to some person who normally, you know, is lo local irritant. <laughs> right? Now, the sleep yoga, since we're going to break now, the sleep yoga is when you fall asleep, don't think that you're lying in a dark space of nothingness. You do want the lights out, and you do want noise, and you want to sink quietly into this nice, calm, organic cotton pillow. And enjoy that, but and you will go unconscious at some moment. You'll let go and you'll drop out of your five senses, and you'll go into interior space, and hopefully won't have any disturbing dream anyway, and we'll have even some just pure deep sleep. But but where you actually go, and this is in the so-called Book of the Dead, you go beneath this place of darkness into a place called clear light which is a plane of infinite energy, it's like the nirvana plane, according to Buddhist science, you could call it, and yet it's not really a plane apart from this, because this is made of that, made of it, actually. But we normally have no access to it, except when we deeply sleep. But the, but the, the yoga is to just imagine, 
or remind yourself, but once I fall deep asleep, I'm not going to be lying in a dark space of nothingness because then I wouldn't feel refreshed. My cells wouldn't feel renewed in the morning if I was lying in nothingness because nothingness would give me no energy. And instead, I'm lying in a bed in a bath of infinite energy, benevolent, positive energy that's just there for me to re restore me so when I wake up, I'm going to be ready to go to yoga. <laughs> level 1 or level 10, whatever it is, I'll be ready for it. That's men lost sleep yoga, okay? Taking a moment to mindfully fall asleep, okay? So if there are other questions, please hold the question unless it's a really burning one. And uh, because you need sleep, you had a travel today through the spring-like day that we oddly had today. And then now we have the wind and we go home and get cozy and go to sleep, okay? Okay? All the best. Have a nice, nice. sweet dream.